Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Kubo. Uh, I'm an assistant professor and uh, coordinator of history and theory at the Gerald D. Hines College of Architecture and Design uh, at the University of Houston. And I'm speaking with you today from Houston, uh, not from Melbourne, uh, where I had planned to be this month um, on a residency fellowship at Monash uh, to work on a research project on lateness, uh, which I'll talk about today as my topic. Uh, and so instead, I'm joining you virtually uh, in the hopes that uh, someday I will uh, be able to be there in person, hopefully soon, uh, and that this will be a kind of a teaser uh, until then. Uh, and I, I want to thank Naomi Stead, uh, Timothy Moore, Jordan Kaufman, and everybody, uh, everybody at Monash that has made this possible uh, and is giving me the opportunity to join you all virtually uh, now, but hopefully in person in the future. So I'm going to share a few slides with you. Uh, hopefully this won't be this won't be too long. Uh, this will go maybe for about 25 minutes, uh, maybe a little bit longer, and then uh, there will be uh, a Q and A on Thursday morning that I'm hoping uh, all of you can join for uh, and ask questions to further the discussion uh, about the things that I'm going to show uh, now. And this is going to be a little bit casual, a little bit informal. This is more uh, in something done in the sense of putting together a series of thoughts that I've had. Uh, lately on these questions of lateness rather than uh, the final result of a more formal research project. And so I'm very much hoping for your feedback in the Q&A. Uh, and I should say that this is a project that has been done collaboratively. I'm one of uh, four people that have been working together uh, on these questions of lateness and temporality in, uh, in architecture and art. Uh, especially in the second half of the 20th century and the beginning of the, the 21st century. Uh, the four of us are Mimi Zeiger, based in Los Angeles, uh, Enrique Ramirez, based in New York, uh, Chris Grimley, based in Boston, uh, and myself. And some of us, uh, like Mimi, in this article uh, recently published uh, in Ness Magazine, uh, have already been writing and speculating on topics around <clears throat> different questions of lateness uh, in culture and criticism and in architecture. The lateness project began for us out of uh, a sense of a certain kind of historical benchmark, let's say, that we wanted to explore. Uh, we felt like, especially around 2018, 2019, in the last few years, uh, there, there was a lot of celebration of uh, an older benchmark of 100 years, especially of uh, the Bauhaus. Uh, and those kinds of anniversaries of early, what's typically referred to as early or avant-garde uh, modern movement or modernism. And we felt like uh, we wanted to explore a different kind of a benchmark, not the hundred year-ish kind of century of modern, uh, modernism or modernity, but um, let's say the second half of that. Uh, and what was referred to and kind of understood as the death of the modernist project and a condition that we felt like we very much still lived in and were a part of uh, and wanted to explore. And I think it's epitomized uh, quite succinctly by this uh, collage by Stanley Tigerman called The Titanic uh, from 1978 that uh, refers in a quite literal uh, way to the sinking of modernism as represented by uh, Mises' Crown Hall, an image that many of us know. Uh, this kind of historical benchmark of the death of the modernist project for us was keyed to other sorts of dates, and especially for uh, the, the kind of window of dates around, uh, hinged around things like uh, 1968, the kind of uh, Annus Horribilis of uh, Paris, May 1968, and a host of other events all around the world. Um, it was a year, let's say, a year as uh, representative of many years, kind of before and after, uh, in its immediate context of uh, rioting of rupture of cultural fissure, uh, notably in the streets of Paris uh, during May 1968, but also in many other places. So in Mexico City, for example, uh, Tlatelolco uh, became a site of protests uh, uh, by students, uh, the working class, and many others for better conditions in society uh, that took place in a canonical site of modernity and of avant-garde modernism. In Mexico, Mario Pani's uh, project, uh, Pani was referred to as, for example, the Le Corbusier of Mexico as one of the kind of founding uh, heroes or fathers of modernism. Uh, and that became, out of these protests, 
a site of massacre and of uh, state violence uh, perpetrated uh, onto the populations that were rioting. Uh, there were many other events around 1968, uh, riots at the Chicago uh, Democratic Convention in the US. Uh, this was a year after the, the Six Day War uh, in Israel Palestine. Uh, this was a period of assassinations, uh, of the deepening of the Vietnam War, the Milan Massacre, and other sorts of things. And so it was very clearly a cultural moment for us when uh, a certain faith in a kind of uh, modernity or modernist project was, was ending. Something had clearly uh, ended and something was shifting culturally that inaugurated a new kind of reality that we wanted to look at. Uh, in architecture, there were corresponding cultural shifts. Uh, one was generational, uh, literally the deaths of the, the founding kind of male uh, uh, canonized modernist heroes was taking place exactly in these years. The Corbusier died a few years earlier in 1965, but then in 1969, uh, both Mies and uh, Walter Gropius uh, die in the same year. Uh, along with other sort of canonical modernist figures that had uh, died either at the end of the 1950s, like Frank Lloyd Wright, or uh, through the 1960s, like Eero Saarinen. And so there was a kind of generational passing of the torch. Uh, also critiques uh, of existing architectural uh, institutions, educational institutions, uh, and other kinds of touchstone events, like the fire at uh, Yale, uh, School of Architecture, the Argent Architecture Building, Paul Rudolph's uh, famous building. Uh, not clear whether it was deliberately set, sort of of unknown origin, but certainly was taken as uh, also as a kind of benchmark for a certain uh, kind of demise of uh, the modernist project as elder uh, figures like Paul Rudolph uh, were continuing uh, the project relative to their students. Uh, I remind you that the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris was also a site of violence, uh, one of the crucial sites of uh, May 68 um, protests in Paris. In 1972, of course, uh, another touchstone event, the demolition uh, of the pruitt Igo apartments in St. Louis, uh, something that was taken not just by architects, but uh, at large as uh, yet another benchmark or kind of touchstone for you know, something you could point to as a, a clear sign of the ending of a certain kind of faith uh, in the present and in the future and in the capacities of uh, modernism or of the kind of modern world to inaugurate a better future uh, and the kind of collapse of the social project that had accompanied it. Accompanied it. Uh, it was certainly taken in literature and architecture uh, in many, many uh, platforms uh, as a kind of official death date. Uh, this is according to Charles Jenks uh, in his book, uh, The Language of Postmodernism. Uh, 1977, um, as what he declared to be the official death date of modern architecture and ties quite specifically to this moment of Puerto Rico in 1972. Uh, and all of this is summarized uh, later by uh, historians and other characters like Bifo Berardi, the Italian uh, kind of radical uh, political uh, theorist and activist, uh, in books like this one, After the Future, uh, he talks about 1977 as a year that for him marked uh, the definitive end of uh, radical political movements on behalf of uh, workers in Italy, uh, in which he was a participant. And he keys this idea of after the future to uh, the Sex Pistols, uh, their, their album Nevermind the Bollocks came out in 1977, uh, and the kind of clarion call of uh, the Sex Pistols, for example, uh, no future, right? no future for you, no future for me. Uh, and what Bifo Berardi terms the slow cancellation of the future. In other words, what's dying here is not just the modernist project, but more specifically a belief in uh, and a faith in a future. So the future as a project in some sense uh, dies. Uh, I, I, just as a reminder, uh, early avant-garde, uh, self-declared modernists, uh, members of the modern movement by their own declaration, were obsessed with the future. Future, uh, futurism and revolution was very much uh, the kind of ideological, um, let's say, ethos or uh, kind of belief framework for you know, all sorts of characters that we know, the Italian futurists, uh, the Futurist Manifesto, Le Corbusier, the idea of architecture, or uh, revolution, uh, that, that the state of architecture was linked to 
the state of a kind of a revolutionary politics uh, in society. And so really, uh, part of this is a, a going back to the history of time and temporality, concepts of temporality uh, over the past century plus. And I think it's, it's possible to say that uh, certainly early avant-garde modernism uh, believed in, or let's say allowed only uh, one sense of time, uh, or maybe two that turn out secretly to be one. Uh, and by that, I mean, of course, a belief in uh, the present, that architecture, right, in these kinds of famous declarations, this is Mies in Architecture in the Times, architecture is the will of the epoch translated into space, that what one wanted uh, and the only real way to be as an architect was to try to be of one's time, right? There was this notion of the zeitgeist, of being contemporary, uh, being contemporaneous with technological and other social developments of one's time, and that what you couldn't do was look backwards. Uh, it is not possible to move forward and look backwards. He who lives in the past cannot advance. The thing that they were scared of or kind of disallowed as a way of attaching themselves to the present was any ability to look backwards. That was kind of prohibited. And so uh, I think that these two modes, the faith in the future and the need to be of one's time are kind of linked and maybe secretly are kind of uh, part of the same expression. The only way to advance into the future was to be thoroughly of one's present. So being contemporary and projecting forward into the future are in some sense continuous with the same project, I think you could argue. Uh, and in any case, what's not possible, what is absolutely uh, forbidden is to look backwards. Uh, and so there are signs of this kind of shot through this sort of avant-garde production. Le Corbusier, for example, of the Plan Voisin, uh, 1925 for Paris, that's known as <clears throat> one of the major uh, acts or propositions of tabula rasa, of this kind of clearing or demolition. Uh, but as a reminder, Le Corbusier included in this project uh, certain kinds of preservation of older historical buildings of kind of a smattering of different styles, Gothic, Renaissance, kind of later Baroque, etc., uh, that existed on the site in this part of Paris. But he was very careful to say that this kind of preservation he saw as keeping some of these elements almost as, as neutered fragments of the past, as relics, as things that by becoming kind of neutered, uh, frozen in time or in amber in this sort of act of preservation, lost any capacity to affect the present. They became kind of dead residues of the past that could be admired as kind of follies or trinkets almost, but that had no longer uh, any capacity to infect the present, if you like, and that this was maybe one of the first acts of uh, something that you could see as an attempt to prevent the ghosts uh, from the past from infecting or haunting, in some sense, the present, uh, and therefore uh, being as contemporary as possible without risk of, of the past kind of uh, entering one's uh, space. And all of this, I think, is what's really encapsulated in the Titanic collage, uh, not just the literal deaths of the modernists, but the, the death of the modernist project kind of full stop, and specifically of uh, the need to be uh, contemporary, to be only of one's time as the only permissible category, and of the belief in the future as a kind of project that is now lost. So uh, one of the questions we were asking was, uh, after this kind of half century of uh, lateness was uh, sort of what comes after this loss in the belief uh, in the future. Uh, our answer, at least projectively, uh, is that what, what happens uh, afterwards, what comes in place of this belief in the future uh, or in contemporaneity is lateness, is, is a kind of resurgence of the past in the present and uh, an exposure suddenly to other kinds of temporality where the past comes rushing back uh, and where there starts to be certain sorts of layerings of the past, the present, uh, and possibly the future that are signposts of this kind of epistemic condition of uh, lateness. And so we wanted to ask the question in our own time of 
uh, where do we stand after something like 50 years of being late? What does it mean to be late, too late? Late for what? What happened? What's the after, right? Is there a kind of after party or other sort of potential that's unfolded in that? But uh, we felt like there hadn't been uh, the attention that we were sort of interested in in, in the cultural condition of lateness, uh, as well as the architectural condition of lateness that's summarized by somebody like Charles Jenks, uh, specifically in this book, Late Modern Architecture, uh, first published in 1980. So it's the successor to his book on postmodernism. And so postmodernism and late modernism were for us these kind of two oscillating categories of a kind of periodization or a certain sort of temporal categorization, late versus post, as two different responses to the question of what comes after mainstream modernism has ended. Uh, it's also, of course, related to other sorts of terms that are circulating uh, at the time and since then, uh, specifically late capitalism, uh, late modernity, and then the sort of overlap in somebody like Frederick Jameson between uh, an idea of postmodernism, not, uh, not as a stylistic category, not architectural postmodernism as a style, but rather the broader cultural condition of postmodernity, postmodernism as a, as a cultural condition that corresponds to what he uh, and Mandel and others describe as late capitalism uh, or the conditions of late capital. Uh, all of this is summarized, I think, pretty. Um, pretty nicely by uh, this exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, curated by Arthur Drexler in 1979, called Transformations in Modern Architecture. Uh, that's a survey of the previous 20 years or so of architectural production uh, globally, and which captures something of this sense of demise of the modernist project and of a cultural condition of lateness. Uh, Transformations garnered a huge amount of criticism for its curatorial method and uh, its method of display, uh, as you see here, in which an extraordinary number of projects, something like 400 projects, were put together, uh, strung together one after the other after the other, and grouped essentially in categories of like with like. Uh, buildings that were similar formally or looked like each other were grouped together. And this was seen, this kind of leveling operation was seen as uh, hugely um, embarrassing or uh, kind of dismissive of the works that were being put on display. And this is, I remind you, the Museum of Modern Art, uh, an institution that was largely responsible for the project of, pro of promoting and sort of promulgating modernism uh, for uh, at least the previous 50 years, and was seen as, as institutionally part and parcel of the modernist uh, project up until this point. Uh, you can see this curatorial method in the uh, catalog, uh, it's in some sense even more brutal as a, as a form of leveling than, than the exhibition itself, the, the display and the exhibition. Uh, of these kinds of chapters, uh, Colonnade and Roof, for example, it puts together a whole series of buildings that become very quickly somewhat indistinguishable from each other, other than on kind of minute levels, as minor variations of a type that, uh, as the formal ideas of mainstream modernism have become more and more widespread and more and more replicated and copied, uh, that, that there is this kind of neutral uh, leveling and there's the inability to produce anything new. Um, it's pointed up uh, uh, even more so, I would say, in the section on glass skins, glass skins as a kind of trope of this sort of late modern aesthetics, uh, where you get the sense that these are all simply different forms of the same thing. You know, each building kind of looks like all the other buildings and that they're kind of uh, all sort of strutting and gyrating and trying to look original, but that what in fact you see is repetition, replication to the point of exhaustion, sort of over and over and over again. Uh, the exhibition also was criticized uh, very heavily for including uh, only one section of, with color imagery, uh, at the center of the exhibition, a series of light boxes uh, with these kinds of photographs. These are some of the photographs from the exhibition that were reproduced in color, uh, entirely of glass skin, often mirror glass buildings like the ones that you see here. And this is criticized as a kind of co-opting of the exhibition by corporate interests, but Drexler was rather clear that uh, he was extremely interested in photography's relationship to these kinds of late modern, aesthetically late modern uh, buildings, and that photography was really the proper medium for capturing the fleeting reflections of this sort that you see 
the photograph on the right is by Wayne Tom, uh, based in Los Angeles, a photographer who is known for these kinds of photographs that captured the ephemeral reflections of these kinds of buildings. Uh, Jenks tries to put some kind of stylistic definition, uh, similar to what he had done for postmodernism, uh, onto these sorts of categories. And he tries to distinguish what he sees as post versus what he sees as late. So he, he talks, for example, about postmodernism in terms of what he calls double coding, the idea that a building would be half modern but also half something else. And by the something else, he, he means generally historical references, uh, clearly marked historical references to a different kind of uh, uh, building of another temporality. Uh, by contrast, he says late modern architecture is singly coded. It kind of doubles down on modernism and its formal tropes, but it takes these ideas and forms to an extreme, as he says, exaggerating the structure and technological image in its attempt to provide amusement or aesthetic pleasure. He describes it as ultra-modern uh, in its exaggeration, extreme logic, extreme uh, circulatory and mechanical emphasis, mannered and decorative use of technology, and as a kind of complication, ultimately, uh, of early avant-garde modernism. And so he gives some of these categories uh, of what he's trying to talk about. Extreme repetition, uh, enclosed hermetically sealed skin volumes, a reductive elliptical gridism that becomes extremely hard to read formally or semantically, unlike the clarity semantically uh, of a lot of postmodernism. Uh, and especially slick skin or op effects, uh, or what Jenks calls elsewhere the wet look of these buildings, like we see here, Pacific Design Center, and others that trade in this kind of shimmering optics of glass. Uh, and just to give some examples of this, Fountain Place in Dallas, uh, Pay Cobb Freed, uh, Harry Cobb, who recently passed away, uh, and this sort of uh, endlessly transforming, uh, ambiguous optical character of these buildings that shift depending on the point of view at which you see them, depending on uh, the time of day, the qualities of light, the angle of the sun, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, Cobb's earlier uh, masterwork, the John Hancock Tower in Boston, and again, the optical project, what you could call the late modernist, kind of minimalist uh, optical project uh, of these sorts of mirror glass uh, skins. Uh, and this comes very close to somebody like Jameson uh, at the point when he describes uh, what he uh, calls this cultural condition of postmodernity and its affiliation with late capitalism. When he gets down to architectural brass tacks, uh, it's precisely this kind of hermetically sealed uh, mirror glass, optically complex, uh, geometrically complex building, specifically the Westin, uh, the Bonaventure Hotel uh, in uh, Los Angeles by John Portman and Associates for him is the precise analog of the kind of delirium, what he calls the hyperspace of late capitalism and of this condition of postmodernity, uh, in a way that's rather close to what Jenks describes stylistically as late modern. Uh, I'm, I'm talking to you today and kind of bringing you these thoughts from uh, Houston, Texas, which uh, has very much spurred my thinking on lateness, uh, late modern uh, aesthetics and uh, late modernity in architecture as a very unusual uh, kind of environment. Uh, Houston is in many ways, I would argue, a late city. Uh, it's certainly described that way uh, in this kind of literature. These are the books that have been uh, written sort of in urbanism and architecture uh, over the years, the last 20, 30 years on Houston, uh, that have these kinds of titles. Uh, the last American city, because it's the only city that uh, uh, major American city that doesn't have zoning and allows a kind of rampant uh, capitalism uh, without limits. Uh, or for Lars Lerup, more famously, after the city. The idea that the urban condition of a metropolis like Houston comes in some sense after the traditional uh, uh, dense, compact idea of the city, or at least the European city, has died. So that, in other words, Houston is, again, something that comes uh, as a condition after the demise of uh, something more normative or more mainstream. Uh, Houston is also uh, temporarily late uh, in the sense that uh, its heyday in the 70s and 80s coincided exactly with this period that Jenks and others have been describing as the kind of high 
point or peak of uh, late modern aesthetics or kind of late stylistically late modern architecture. Uh, most of the major uh, kind of architectural landmarks in Houston, uh, at least the downtown, are from this era. It's also temporarily late in the sense that uh, Houston's peak in those years corresponded to uh, depression and kind of economic stagnation everywhere else. Uh, Houston as a city uh, is based economically on oil, on the oil industry, and on petroleum, uh, which means that in the 70s, specifically between 1973 and 83, uh, when there was a spike in crude oil prices under the OPEC embargo, um, Houston uh, did extremely well at the same time that this induced basically uh, recession and stagnation everywhere else. So Houston was late in the sense that uh, while what you see on the left was the condition everywhere else, generally certainly in North America, uh, of lines for gas uh, and you know economic decline and collapse and virtually no construction uh, or very little construction anywhere else, Houston at the same time was in a very different kind of uh, temporal mode. Houston was projecting the tallest building in the world that would be built in these decades. Houston was booming and was doing quite well. And then on the back end of that, after uh, 1983, uh, and through the 1980s, in the period when everyone else uh, started to recover economically from uh, the collapse in oil prices, Houston then crashed. And so the end point of this kind of heyday of uh, Houston architecture and urbanism was precisely uh, sort of out of time, out of kind of temporality, or too late uh, relative to everybody else in a way that came to be called the see-through years uh, in reference to the building projects that were abandoned in Houston after, after the mid-1980s uh, and stood there sort of as open floor plates that you could see through uh, from the highway. And so through this period, uh, as I say, the major architectural landmarks of Houston are sort of a cornucopia of many of the high points uh, really anywhere of this sort of late modern aesthetics. Pennzoil Place uh, by Philip Johnson, Johnson Berge, uh, again, a kind of optically and formally geometrically complex uh, building. Uh, also, Johnson Berge, which did an enormous uh, number of projects in Houston in these years, uh, for many for Gerald Hines, the developer. Um, Post Oak Towers, yet another kind of example of this sort of aesthetics. Johnson Berge Transco Tower, uh, yet another one. And then other sort of more ambiguous landmarks of this kind of, uh, these sort of late modern tropes of mirroring, reflection, distortion, skewing, faceting, uh, and other sorts of optically and formally complex uh, manipulations of building profiles, like uh, the CAM, the Contemporary Art Museum, designed by Gunnar Burkertz, uh, and opened in 1974 uh, in Houston. Uh, and some of my students uh, with me at the University of Houston uh, this past year have been working on documenting, uh, drawing, and trying to understand the, some of these buildings that were designed in this time period uh, through sort of complex forms of drawings and other graphic production uh, and through the production of books, some of which, like the one on the right, pay homage to uh, Doug Milburn's The Last American City in their form, uh, to look at various sites, uh, not just buildings, but other sites of late modernity and uh, late stage capitalism in Houston, like the underground network of tunnels uh, that link most uh, of the buildings, of the high-rise buildings in downtown Houston. And so finally, uh, just to walk you through some of the other concepts that this project of lateness has opened up for us, um, it's led to a, a, a look at other concepts of temporality, of temporality and time in relation to architecture that uh, circulate through much of the time period that we're looking at and that introduce other notions of temporality, I think, into the equation. There's, of course, uh, in literary theory and cultural uh, and aesthetic theory, uh, the notion of late style uh, from Adorno through to uh, Edward Said. And again, this notion of late style, uh, artistic late style, or aesthetic late style, uh, as also having to do with a condition of being out of time, sort of in, incorrect in one's time uh, of coming after or of surviving sort of stubbornly uh, into a time period that no longer corresponds with uh, a, a mode of making art or an art, right? This idea in Adorno that in the history of art, late works are the catastrophes. Uh, late works are acts of rupture or of the, un, the irreconcilable. 
the kind of unknowable, uh, or Said's extension of the concept to the idea of exile, uh, an imposed, a self-imposed exile from what is generally acceptable, coming after it and surviving beyond it. So lateness as a form of uh, survival or of resistance. Other concepts uh, like hauntology uh, developed uh, in particular uh, by Mark Fisher uh, in this uh, sort of book, Ghosts of My Life. Uh, hauntology is a concept that comes originally from Jacques Derrida uh, in the book Spectres of Marx, uh, who's looking at kind of the original haunt or the original ghost uh, of the modernist project, namely uh, sort of Marx's specter of communism, uh, and develops this notion of hauntology that Fisher extends sort of into the present. Uh, hauntology for Fisher and others is the idea of uh, a kind of inability to escape the past. So not the modernist uh, attempts to prevent the, the past from infecting the present, but uh, a temporal condition in which the past is constantly flooding into and sort of corrupting any ability to develop anything new in the present, uh, sometimes self-consciously for uh, authors of uh, artistic or creative production, but more often a condition where people uh, are unaware of the ways in which they are condemned to these kinds of feedback loops uh, of the past kind of ceaselessly coming uh, back into the present. Uh, this is an article recently by Mimi Zeiger, uh, again called Feedback Loops on the Ways in Which These Past Futures uh, Haunt Architecture's Present. Uh, Zeiger is looking at the work, for example, of uh, more recently of Johnston Mark Lee, uh, architects, uh, and the ways in which a contemporary imagery or representations of buildings have become in a way condemned, sometimes self-consciously, but often not, to uh, include or incorporate constantly fragments of the past that come sort of hurtling back into these sorts of representations that seem unable to escape them, uh, and that try to leverage forms of representation of the past as a way of channeling some sort of ideology or kind of claim about the present. Uh, but in ways that uh, Zeiger sees as often being laundered of the actual political or cultural content uh, of these images from the past, like this reuse, as you see uh, in this collage of a Johnston Markley project in Chicago, uh, of super studio uh, imagery from the 1970s, sort of into this image, but now kind of without the, the actual content of the super studio uh, project, or uh, Johnston Markley's curation uh, of one of the recent Chicago biennials <clears throat> titled Making New History, uh, and which sort of posed at its center this conundrum of, you know, this, this strange binary of new history, right? The new, but also the old, uh, in some sort of uneasy combination, and which had certain light motifs uh, like Adolf Loos's Chicago Tribune Tower uh, from the past, from 1922, that were given as prompts for people to, um, sort of run with in the present as a kind of spur towards their own work, and which itself as a term, as a title, uh, is taken from a previous Ed Ruscha uh, project that you see on the left uh, called Making New History, uh, this artwork uh, from 2009, which they themselves are recycling. And so it's kind of new that is endlessly recycled out of the past, uh, sometimes uh, rather unselfconsciously. Uh, other forms of uh, sort of strange temporality that are related to this. Uh, another is the idea of retro futures, this kind of looking backward to the past in order to unlock some kind of future uh, that was foreclosed. Uh, people like Owen Hatherley developed this concept in books like this, Militant Modernism, that goes back and looks at especially the kind of brutalist works uh, or heroic concrete uh, buildings, social housing, cultural centers, and other works uh, of the 1960s and 1970s in particular, as emblems in their time of a certain future projection that has now been foreclosed uh, or has ended. And uh, this paradox of, an, of a, a kind of retrospective nostalgia for a future, right? A future that never arrived uh, and the ability to channel other foreclosed sorts of futures out of a past uh, which has now uh, often been forgotten. So nostalgia, retro futures, etc. Uh, and I remind you that uh, Rainer Banham, uh, in that time period in 1974, in his book Megastructure, 
gives, uh, gives it the title, the, or the subtitle, Urban Futures of the Recent Past. And so there's already this notion of sort of the future as paradoxically historical, right? He describes these uh, buildings uh, in the megastructure book, the emblems of this movement, already as kind of past, as dead, uh, as ruins, or uh, as you see in the uh, title of chapter one, as dinosaurs, dinosaurs of the modern movement. And the sense of these things as relics, or as kind of stubborn, uh, having stubbornly continued into the present uh, as a kind of resistance. Ruination, uh, in that sense, also related to this concept of retro futures or of the stubborn survival and resistance of the physical stuff, the physical matter of these buildings, uh, as, an, as a kind of uh, refusal to um, sort of be of one's time or a, a way of, let's say, uh, buildings becoming dislodged from any kind of contemporaneity and their kind of uh, survival into the present. Ruination was, of course, one of the formal stakes of uh, a certain mode of late modernist uh, production uh, at the time period uh, that I've been describing. Uh, these are the best uh, product uh, showrooms, one of them by uh, James Wines in sight, his office, uh, that traffics in these kinds of tropes of ruination. And that was understood here again as Arthur Drexler uh, in an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, again, the same year as Transformations in Modern Architecture uh, on the best product stores, uh, recognizes this kind of ruination and its sort of problematic temporal quality, right? Uh, a building's apparently ruinous state that pertains not to a world long gone, but to our own, right? A contemporary ruin uh, in the present. Uh, and finally, I would add to this menagerie of other terms for belatedness, historical relation, uh, and other periodizing terms, uh, I would add some very recent ones uh, in the last week or so, a couple of weeks, uh, that have now become in some sense more urgent uh, in our current conditions of not just of pandemic and of quarantine uh, and the very different, uh, very strange and unsettling kinds of temporality that we are all confronted with on a daily basis, but uh, the more, uh, the even more sort of existential uh, dread of climate change as uh, something that's induced a lot of thinking about the sort of strangeness of these temporal modes uh, in being able to act in the present uh, in the condition of a sort of existential dread of the future. Uh, this is just in the last week, again on the left from McSweeney's, uh, this kind of uh, parody uh, of how time works now and the ways in which you know a, a minute can either last an hour or can take 3.5 seconds right, a day, a month, these concepts are relative, they can either be incredibly fast or incredibly short, uh, or the notion of shadow time uh, that uh, I think has been developed by the Bureau of Literary Reality as a, uh, as a kind of parallel or alternative dictionary, uh, and the notion of a parallel time scale that follows one around throughout day-to-day -day, uh, experience of regular time, right, and uh, the feeling of living in two distinctly different uh, temporal scales simultaneously uh, and this is coming very much out of the kind of existential dread of climate change and the ways in which it hangs over any decisions that get made uh, in the present. Uh, and this notion of shadow time has now become the basis just again in the last week uh, for a new efflux uh, reader uh, on architecture and culture uh, compiled by Cristina Pareño Alonso uh, that I encourage you all to read. And so just to wrap up, <coughs> Uh, these are all sort of concepts that we've uh, tried to explore together in this project. Um, there are other concepts that are related to this. For example, there are uh, one strong area of work for us has to do with the stakes of representation, uh, not just of photographs like this one, this is by Baz Prinsen, uh, but also of drawings. Uh, I think I will skip over those for now, but we can maybe talk about them uh, in the discussion. Um, and so I would encourage all of you uh, to submit your questions for the Q&A, uh, and I look forward to uh, seeing you all uh, on Thursday and to engaging in discussion with you. Uh, I really look forward to the questions that you all uh, have and hope to see you soon. Thanks. Uh, this is the Zoom meeting for the question and answer session of Michael's uh, talk on lateness, which I'm sure you've all um,
uh, watched. Um, not that any of you would be, because I know all of you, I think. But if you find yourself in here, if you find yourself here in error, um, please feel free just to stay and listen. Um, so I think you it's also like it's the wrong the wrong movie screening. Yeah, yeah you know. <laughs> Um, uh, I think you all know me also, um, but I'm uh, Jordan Kaufman. I uh, am a research fellow at Monash University. Uh, I'm just here to facilitate uh, this event. Uh, and to begin, um, I would just like to do one of the more important things uh, I think that we do here um, at Monash and really in Australia, uh, which is to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations, uh, which are traditional owners of the land uh, on which Monash operates, um, and pay my respects to their elders, uh, past and present. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I also want to uh, welcome all of you. Um, it's uh, sort of very exciting for all of you to be here. As Michael mentioned, uh, he was, uh, or he is uh, a visiting um, academic at Monash. Uh, he's supposed to be here now, uh, and this event is supposed to run in person, but uh, at least it gives us the opportunity to uh, sort of have people join from all over the place, uh, which it wouldn't uh, otherwise. Um, this is the first in a series of these events uh, at Monash, um, in Monash Art Design and Architecture, or MADA. Um, so keep your eyes open if you're interested in further events uh, like this. Uh, Monash uh, MADA also has uh, a Twitter and an Instagram uh, that can make following these events uh, a little bit easier, uh, on which this is announced. Um, so there aren't uh, so many people uh, who join, so I don't anticipate this being um, super difficult, uh, but you will have the chance to ask Michael your questions um, uh, live, uh, which is sort of the point uh, of, of this, to emulate a little bit what it would be like in, uh, in person. Um, so um, I guess uh, if you have a question, um, then uh, if you could type into the chat function, just question, uh, and we will use that as a way to uh, go through um, uh, the, the list of people. Uh, I would ask maybe that the first time you ask a question, um, limit it to one, uh, and then we'll go back around uh, to see if anyone has, uh, has any further questions. Um, I think that uh, we have found that some sort of best practices you probably are all familiar with on Zoom, um, if you can mute your microphone until it's time for you to uh, ask your question, uh, and then once you have, um, you know, talked with uh, talked with Michael, then mute your microphone again, and we'll we'll come back around. Um, so, um, I mean, I think you all know Michael, but I will. I am going to do a little bio. Um, so, um, we are very fortunate to have Michael uh, here to talk about this project on lateness. Um, just a bit of an introduction to Michael. Um, I am sure that you have gathered that. Uh, when you listen to his talk, if you have read his bio, that he was very modest uh, in his talk. Uh, he is, of course, as he said, um, assistant professor and program coordinator uh, for the architectural history theory and criticism at the University of Houston. Um, but he has also been, among many other things, uh, co-director of the Pink Comma Gallery uh, in Boston, uh, an associate curator for Office US, uh, the US Pavilion at the uh, 2014 International Architecture Exhibition at the Venice Biennale. Um, he's also worked on a number of seminal books, um, recent ones being Imagining the Modern Architecture and Urbanism of the Pittsburgh Renaissance, uh, that's Monticelli uh, last year, the Office US Atlas, which is Lars Muller, 2015, um, and Heroic, Concrete Architecture and the New Boston, um, also Monticelli in 2015, uh, and he is currently preparing a, a fascinating book on the architect's collaborative and authorship um, of the Architectural Corporation after 1945. Uh, so, uh, just to get to it, as we've all heard, uh, Michael and his colleagues are working on this fascinating topic of lateness and temporality uh, in architecture that sort of coalesce uh, an array of interests in architecture that are often uh, siloed, uh, I think, in our fields. Um, we've heard uh, in his talk uh, discussions of politics, history, notions of presentism and futurism, cultural theory, exhibitions, publications, photography, representation, mediation, um, and uh, more are sort of all part of this project uh, in various ways. Um, and I'm sure that you are all joining uh, us today because they have left you with a number of burning questions, um, uh, as it did me. Uh, and uh, I'm going to take the prerogative to uh, start with a question of my own to sort of prompt uh, Michael um, and maybe Enrique as well, who has joined us. Um, 
And uh, I think that this question gets a little bit to the heart of what this project is about, these sort of notions of temporality that pervaded architecture in the late 20th century and which we are still uh, sort of currently coming to terms with and dealing with. Um, and Michael, uh, this has to do with the relationship that you posed between um, postmodernism and late modernism. Um, in your talk, you gave us sort of the, the Jenksian uh, version of this. Um, however, I wonder if you had any further thoughts about how this distinction uh, between post and late or postmodern and late modern uh, might permeate architecture in other ways, uh, through other interpretations or in other guises. Um, and in this same vein, I wonder if that bleeds into what you were hinting at uh, in the relationship between postmodernity and late modernity um, or uh, late stage uh, capitalism. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that, the, I mean, th that's, it's, I think clearly the most conspicuous, let's say, problem zone of the material that I presented in the talk is this messy overlap between things that get talked about as postmodern or in relation to post ideas of postmodernity versus things that are talked about as late modern or talked about in relation to ideas of you know late late capital late state capital late modernity and this the ways in which you know there's a very weird venn diagram of those of those things and it's mm -hmm. um it's been useful for me even in just putting this together to try to think about you know what what overlap there was in let's say that historical moment that I tend to focus on or tended to focus on in the talk and then sort of more broadly from then up until the present, you know, what are the relationships? So, right, as you say, the, the, the version that I dwelled on in particular in the slides was really the, the, Jenks, the Jenks kind of potted uh, stylistic differentiation, which is really the Jenksian mode. I mean, in some sense is, is uh, I would certainly say is the weakest set of definitions of any of these things, right? Because Jenks is a committed classifier as his mode, mm, right? Mm. Interested ultimately in stylistic classifications. And so the distinction between double coding and single coding, for example, or, you know, the, the uh, introduction of historical, explicit historical references from things that are pre-avant-garde modern movement versus the kind of doubling down or exaggeration or multiplication of, you know, uh, self-consciously modernist sort of avant-garde uh, idea content, let's say. And that was where the territory with Drexler and other people is, but it's, um, you know, more broadly, uh, your question actually makes me think a little bit about, you know, when we decided, or we all became interested in thinking about lateness and belatedness as a set of concepts, you know, why not post, you know, postness, post-modernity and all that? And it, I think, there's a certain way that, you know, it's it's probably true that we were, in a way, trying to skew the discussion of the stuff we were interested in out of a set of binaries that, in a way, have been talked about to death, mm. uh, you know, in a lot of ways between the sort of the endless um, sort of attempt to figure out what is the boundary between, you know, when does the post begin and the ways that the idea of being post something you know, suddenly gets you into a discussion about, well, when did the, when did the thing end and when are you out of it and what's the barrier and is there a hard sort of distinction? It's a kind of almost binary discussion that's been gone over various times. And I think we were more interested in broadly in going back and looking at that other term that was floating around, you know, late, lateness, sort of mm -hmm. late modern and um, to get into the messier zone of all of the stuff circulating around that idea of, of you know, ex accepting that you're still in the tradition of something, but that somehow there's this weird designation of late and that late is implicitly negative. Late is implicitly worse or, you know, has descended from, you know, the high or sort of whatever there was before. And that seemed like a kind of messier, more interesting territory, but also one that hadn't been really explored all that much. I'm not sure that that really answers your sort of the question about different kinds of distinctions, but um, you know, they certainly, there's a lot of messy overlap for the, some of the people that I invoked in the talk, like, you know, Jameson who links, um, you know, late capitalism with postmodern, postmodernity as a cultural condition. Right. Right. And so, but where his, at the point when he invokes architecture, the architectural references actually correspond much less towards things that 
uh, something that somebody like Jenks would classify as stylistically postmodern and more to something that would be stylistically late modern in his kind of toolkit, right? The Bonaventure Hotel and all of that. Right, right. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, let's see. Only, well, um, I see Matthew has a question, but Ari has a follow up question uh, to that one. So uh, if we could go to Ari's follow up question and then we'll get to Matthew, uh, that would be perfect. I think uh, building on what Jordan's asking, I wonder the degree to which the set of questions are particular to the American context or generalizable to other contexts. Um, on one hand, arguably the states were already late to modernism when the emigres came um, or they shifted you know, in the post-war period to post-war modernism. But I'm just thinking about my own um, recent work in the Japanese context uh, around the 70s, which building on Jenks in, in 77, there was an, a very f a kind of pivotal um, issue of Japan architect called post-metabolism. Mm -hmm. Post-metabolism issue was both, was like triply coded as post-metabolism, new wave and pluralism which was all of the confusions about how do you call, how do you coordinate these kinds of moments? And, and rather than Tigerman's Titanic, it was just this kind of cloudy, misty diagram of all of these people floating around because it wasn't sure where to ground them anymore. Um, but then that was taken up by the um, IAUS and turned into the New Wave Japanese Architecture Exhibition in 78. And then turned into further books in the early 80s that were then called contemporary Japanese architecture with chapters on pluralism that introduced the new wave. And it's all of the same complexities of lates and posts and what do you call these things and how do you start to organize them. But I wonder um, the degree to which the conditions that you're talking about, the the late capital conditions, the political conditions were, were global, but the degree to which the um, way that the problem is being dealt with has particular or generalizable out of the American context, obviously, you know, Jenks and Drexler, and um, it's very much grounded in an American context as you described it, but maybe not given the breadth of your collaborators. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's a really important point that there's you know, it immediately, and you see that this this fissure opens up uh, anytime you have to sort of pick a discussion about these terms or the you know, their or concepts as cultural or sort of cultural shifts or cultural categories, and when you talk about them as stylistic as things to do with architectural culture and sort of architectural culture and architectural discourse, and I think you're absolutely right that there are in terms of broader cultural shifts that are happening, it's very much global. It's related to a set of global phenomena, uh, but that it does shake out differently in different architecture cultures and discourses in different places, right? So the, uh, you know, I am, um, my brain is maybe now more tuned, especially towards, also towards a particular set of stylistic stuff. And that part probably has to do uh, nowadays with being in Houston, for example. So that's a very, right, a, a particular temporality, a particular aesthetics of um, the glass skin, of mirror glass, of a particular kind of geometric, uh, let's say optical repertoire of things. And that's, you know, that's particular to that context um, and doesn't happen in the same way in various other contexts. And it's maybe, but maybe there's some flexibility in that, you know, again, that, that one could find in the in the idea of late or lateness as a more fluid sort of shift into a different kind of condition versus the one of the problems that I've tended to have in a lot of cases with the application of this term post as in the example you described post metabolism is that there's a sudden there's a kind of sharper edge and there's an attempt to kind of defi to periodize basically and to define a boundary in a way that feels sharper to me. And certainly at the moments when different people have applied the term post in their context, you know, post whatever the previous thing is, there's a kind of either generational or factional, like a camp that one has, you know, left and moved on. Um, there's that kind of need to adjudicate in some sense, 
you know, a group and then the emergence out of a group and then into the next thing. And then versus the idea of lateness, that was sort of the idea that some sort of project had kind of petered out or withered out and the kind of slow, like the long, the long tail or the sort of malaise afterwards. Uh, and that felt like it related better. Maybe another part of it was that it felt like, you know, in terms of what we were all looking at and thinking about, it felt like that idea of the kind of like the after and maybe the potential of, you know, the after party, like is after, does it have to be negative in the way that late usually is sort of framed? Or is it, you know, in the sense of like too late, the party's over, FOMO, fear of missing out, you know, it felt like it related better towards a lot of, uh, to a lot of contemporary things that we were trying to think about, about speed, slowness, being kind of out of alignment with a certain temporality in a way that the whole notion of post seemed, um, I don't know, maybe less fertile ground in that moment, right? Not that, it, not that all the issues of it have been sort of hashed out, but yeah, I think absolutely, I mean. But the corollary, yeah. the, well, the kind of interconnected messiness is that the term post-metabolism didn't last very long. It was very quickly shifted to uh, explanation through a lens of pluralism, and then more importantly, through the concept of new wave which is a different kind of, it's a more like a Vico cyclical temporality than a linear temporality. It's like, this is the next wave of a series of waves that's cycling back or may or may not be cycling back. So yeah. it yeah. actually had possibly has a different temporality embedded in it, but yeah. it, it's the similar moment of um, cultural moment also. Let's well, and it's, I think that, I mean, my take on that is that there's a, again, in the, in the application of this post label from some of the people that were doing it at different points, there's almost a kind of acceptance and reinforcing of the previous periodization. There's a kind of acceptance of a certain periodization as such, and then a statement of, you know, we are post that. We, we now are kind of sealing it off and in a way that becomes problematic, either because then you suddenly get condemned to all the problems of the previous periodization, that it doesn't last very long, you cycle back. So like Michael Hayes has this term um, in his book on Haydock, uh, he talks about the late avant-garde in the 60s, 70s, and he includes Haydock as a kind of member of this. this and I sort of thought that was a an interesting and kind of funny notion of, you know, these paradoxical terms of you know the late avant-garde so it's a kind of reclaiming of the in the cycle of the avant-garde but now framed as late like is that i'm not sure what that sort of you know what 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 that means yet yeah okay um let's see we have um a question from matthew and then uh macarena um i think you have a question if we have to cycle back to the topic of ari's uh um that's okay. It's okay if you, if you want to jump in quickly. I, I, I don't mind waiting for a minute. It's just super quickly. Um, thank, thank you, Michael. I, I really enjoyed your presentation and I'm happy to be part of this. I didn't want to put my camera earlier because I'm still having breakfast. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Please see me eating in the background. Um, but just building on what Ari said, um, if, if we're trying to understand the present, uh, which I, I think that's what the, the idea behind, if, if I understood properly, it's trying to make sense of, of the recent past, but, but with a present um, emphasis as well. Um, I was surprised uh, that there is no mention of post-colonial at all. Um, and and I, in that sense, I, I think it builds up a little bit in what Ari was saying is, can we actually um, still try to understand the present uh, just just building on that U, U.S. Uh, perspective. Um, and if we want to understand what late modern means, um, we, you know, should consider post-colonial as well as a, as a cultural condition and and um, building into, into global and the definitions of, or framings of, of global, on a global right. modernity even. Right. Well, this is, I, again, I think this was in the, in the, first part of the talk you know the that framing of the idea of certain cultural projects or social projects ending in that in the let's say the 60s by the 60s um i think it's very much tied to 
uh, post-colonialism as you know one of the many sort of things that's happening, uh, not even under the surface, but just explicitly through all of these things, the ways in which certain modernity projects are, you know, were tied very heavily to nation state projects and to colonial projects, and then the ways that those, so part of what's shifting or getting dismantled or being challenged or ending in that period, of course, is tied to different forms of post-coloniality, uh, and that's something that has to be sort of accounted for, right? And then the long, again, you get, I think, into the idea of, you know, the haunting, the hauntology, or the go the ghosts of these things that, you know, the ghosts of, right, which, you know, Reinhold Martin has talked about, certainly talked about postmodernism uh, in terms of this idea of ghosts, like the ghosts of utopia, and utopia as a colonial project in many ways, right? And so this is, you know, there's a kind of maybe similar uh, or relatable attempt to do all of those kinds of things. But yeah, I think it's absolutely, you know, part of that, part of that uh, wave, exactly. So we used, we ended up using, you know, 1968. It was, we started thinking about these things a few years ago, and it was really, it was a very convenient, let's say, 50-year benchmark, you know, like, yeah. versus the previous ones. But it's, you know, of course, it refers to a, a much broader zone of uh, cultural stuff that's going on. Yeah. I guess I was just surprised not to hear the word. Um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I felt all the time that it was like the elephant in the room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, so the, yeah, maybe this is a good time for my question. I, I, I was wondering about, I, I guess the, um, there's, you've been, you, you talked a little bit about things ending, right? Or, you know, there's some attempt to, um, periodize or to, to hit historicize periodization. But I, I wonder if it would be fruitful to start from a, a different perspective that would maybe assume a sort of continuity of, I, I'm thinking in particular of um, the, the modernists, right? You, you know, you had some modernist faces and they all died and disappeared, but you know, there, there continue to be modernists to this day, right? And you know, even the, the avant-garde as a, as a kind of a group, right? There, there are people who consider themselves and have considered themselves all the way through as sort of part of a ongoing avant-garde project, let's say. I, um, I, I wonder if it would, yeah, it, um, it, you know, it's a tough thing to do because you don't want to, I, I don't know, adjudicate sort of whether these groups exist or not. On the one hand, it, it's hard to sort of delve into sort of what their values are and to what, what sort of lay those out and yeah, then to adjudicate whether they're existing or not. Um, but, but, but yeah, some, some model that, um, maybe takes it for granted that, that kind of all these projects are continuing and trying to um, see, see them in a kind of relationship to each other in any given period of time. Yeah. I, I don't know, I'm, I, I'm wondering if that would, because again, it's, it's like that you had some people, the, the, um, the, the modernists, right? And then you sort of hint at, you, you know, Johnson, uh, you, you know, Cobb, there, there are some people I sort of recognize, but, you know, I, I also know you do work on uh, bureaucrats, like back office, um, you know, they, they I, I might consider them sort of modernists in a kind of classical sense, right? Continuing a sort of project of modernity, um, but, but, you know, not, um, you know, in a, in a, uh, in a different way than um, Gropius or Mies was, um, but, but well, is, you know, yeah. Maybe, maybe some of the same values. Uh, sure, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is this is exactly what I mean about um, you know the point that I tried to make earlier about uh, the idea of lateness as accepting the continuation of the previous thing, right? And that it's it's not versus the more explicitly self-conscious characters in certainly by the end of the nineteen sixties, nineteen seventies, and afterwards that were kind of allying themselves, for example, to what came to be kind of branded stylistically as the postmodern movement, right? And we're making very hard um, kind of statements architecturally about, you know, reintroducing certain kinds of historical references. I mean, what, however it shook out, right, in the concrete stuff of buildings or, you know, architectural propositions, 
as a way of you know being quite clear that they were not trying to perpetuate certain ideologies that you know they had been educated in um, versus the idea of lateness, which you know of course was not it wasn't a term that those characters ever applied to themselves they didn't think of themselves as late right it is a, it's a it's a retrospective uh, kind of periodizing term and it's an it's an although they, 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 they also might not have seen themselves as modern so, so well that's the thing and but some did and some I mean some like you know Gunnar Burkouts you know absolutely saw himself as continuing in that kind of tradition I mean they were right it was uh, and yet something was different I mean things were visibly different in ways that people like Jenks that were looking for really in a way superficial stylistic distinctions or other people that were looking for deeper deeper than surface level things later were able to start using a term like laid to to kind of convey um, that something had slid or shifted so not there wasn't necessarily a rupture in the sense that all of the many of the debates about Postmodern architectural postmodernism or the postmodern movement versus then you have to make clear distinctions about what you mean by the modern movement tended to revolve around the need to settle, you know, had there been a rupture? If so, of what type? What was the degree of the rupture? So you get things like, um, you know, Jameson's essay, Theories of the Postmodern, that's exactly about, you know, grouping in these kind of four part camps of. You know the the cultural theorists and philosophers that saw, you know, post modernity as continuous, with, you know, modernity in certain ways. The people that thought they were discontinuous, and then the people that were pro one and or, and or anti the other, right? So pro pro, you know, pro anti, anti, you know, etc. And um, there was some kind of looseness or vagueness, and or undecidability in the idea of lateness that felt like it it actually was better able to accept the idea that a lot of the people onto whom that label got applied, like Caesar Pelli, you know, Pelli was not, I mean, I don't think Pelli was going around saying, I'm late. I mean, nobody would have, you know, described themselves that way. And so it, it's this kind of soft, vague middle zone that felt like there was more, it was just more intriguing in a certain way, but it, right. So I think maybe I'm, I might be arguing that that, acceptance of a certain idea of continuity is kind of secretly somewhere there in the project, even if it's, uh, but uh, I take your point that it maybe it's sort of framing that more explicitly is uh, unlocks something or becomes productive. Uh, me Melanie? Oh. Hi, Joel. Hi. No. Oh, am I, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yeah. Hi, Mike. Um, thanks for the super interesting talk. Um, I I have like three comments and I think two was already sort of touched, but I, I just want like affirmation. <laughs> um, so first one is um, on, you seem to be talking about two different definitions of lateness, which is one lateness out of sync with the present moment on one hand and on, and the second definition of lateness is sort of coming after as something as in a precedent. And so I think the former has to do with a value or a judgment as you talked about like it, it's it's a bad thing and then whereas the later the latter seems more neutral you know just the fact that something is coming after something and so how are you or are you distinguishing between these two definitions and i think you've already kind of covered that that the boundaries get blurred that something is both after something and also it's bad because it's late right yeah but there are i mean you're right um, to recognize that there are sort of two different you know one way into this, these notions of lateness for us has been a really around temporal questions of, of speed, speeds and slownesses and the, you know, different ideas of being uh, sort of out of time or out of sync with time or misaligned with certain notions of contemporaneity or being of one's time, et cetera, et cetera. And then the, the different ways that that's been the people have reacted to that or tried to theorize that. And that that's the kind of door to think the contemporary stuff of like FOMO, you know, being too late versus you know, other more positive concepts of being out of, out of a uh, standard time, like, you know, the notion in jazz of being behind the beat or swing time mm -hmm. or things that are kind of strategically out of an alignment with time. And then the second sort of 
set of ideas you described, which has to do, I think you framed it around precedent. Um, I would maybe frame it as a, a related maybe set of uh, ideas about the collapse of temporalities, the collapse of different temporalities into the same moment or the inability to distinguish cleanly, you know, in other words, the, the sort of fracturing or fragmenting of a, of a, maybe a sense of linear time. And that's where mm -hmm. people like Mark Fisher and the idea of hauntology became really productive for us as, you know, the idea of the sort of seeping of different moments of pastness into the present in ways that start becoming harder and harder to unravel or unpack or decipher. And that there, there are a lot of questions about precedent, the explicit or the sort of, uh, explicit or implicit, the aware, the self-aware, the unaware use of precedent and all of these things. And it gets a little bit, I mean, I think of um, Jameson's, you know, Jameson's distinction between parody and pastiche, for example, is sort of somewhere in that. And I think Mark Fisher is talking about, in a way, very similar, similar things. The idea, the difference between being uh, very self-conscious about a particular relationship with a historical precedent versus mm -hmm. what he calls, what, he, what Jameson describes as pastiche, which is the sort of non-self-aware inability to escape a series of things from previous time periods that become sort of layered or folded onto things in the present and a kind of inability to escape them, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, the sort of stacking yeah. of time, which felt like, mm -hmm. you know, was quite related to, I mean, even more, I mean, in the last couple of months, yeah. of course, all of those have taken on very different valences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well, to follow up on that, then um, I think there's also questions of agency. Like, it, it, I mean, who are you late according to who, right? Who decides on which architecture is late to the game or the discourse? Mm -hmm. And I think this is why Makarena's point um, is is like I think really spot on in terms of post-coloniality because I feel like you know, modernism and it's, you know, and it's heyday and thereafter, you know, it creates this discourse and then other parts of the world, like I'll give my example of Korea where they, they, of modern architecture discourse, meaning the Bauhaus, but like not in any systematic way, like they can barely access translations, right? And, and then they're like, holy crap, what's modern architecture? But we're meant to know, so we're late to the game. So they're like really, they're really pissed off because they don't really understand it, but they also feel like they have to be in the game. Yeah. But it's but but it's a very hegemonic condition, right? Like to to feel like you're you're always behind, right? And um, so I think I think the post coloniality things are a really good um, point. And then my final final comment, and I think that's related to Ari's point about metabolism, is you know all this talk of lateness. It's it's about you know the sequential implication of architectural or cultural production, and we think of it through linear time. And I think you mentioned that like linear conceptions of time. And if we think of like the seventh century Issei shrine in Japan, which is like rebuilt every twenty years with new materials, but in the same form, no one's late to anything, right? Like that that shrine is always present. Like it's always it's always on target. <laughs> like it's never late. So I think. But then the irony is that once it enters into the modernist Western discourse of metabolism, because people use the shrine as a metaphor for metabolism, you know, it gets yeah, appropriated as part of part of this teleology, right? So, so I, I think it'll be super exciting to see sort of examples of architecture that undo this linear conceptions of time. Yeah. No, no, I think, yeah, it's a great point. And I think it's so there are a couple of different things in a way that that reminds me of. Uh, let's say your second question or the first part of the, the question. Um, I think it's absolutely the case that, right, one person's lateness is another person's on time or ahead of the game, right, in all of these ways that is, it's, it is, as, as has been said uh, by, you know, uh, various people, it is, it's culturally specific on the one, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's both individually specific and also culturally specific and it kind of shifts and those, sort of gaps or, you know, di differential alignments, I think are really interesting. And it reminds me, for example, like on sort of back to the uh, post-colonial uh, question, you know, it reminds me of, 
like all the debates and development theory about the stages of development and you know does it like do, do country you know modernizing or developing uh, post-colonial nations have to, are they supposed to progress through the stages right. of development or can you basically make a leap where you, that gets you out of the kind of accepted temporality of, you know, what happened in other places in a yeah. slower way, you know, the, exactly those kinds of things of sort of one, you know, what's late in mm -hmm. one uh, place or, or sort of moment or discourse certainly is, is not late in another, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the second part of your question, um, I think is very much related. There's a whole part of it that I didn't really touch on in the in the talk, and uh, partly it's because I'm actually going to give another talk at Monash um, in the the uh, art forum series next week on that's related more towards a sort of set of stuff that I left out, which really has to do with ideas like obsolescence and ru you know the ruin. Um, and there was a little bit of of it in there, but the the persistence of the matter of buildings and questions of maintenance, you know, care, preservation, et cetera, around things that sort of become stubbornly out of time um, because of basically the persistence of the, the thing itself, right? The object or the mm -hmm. building or these, these mm -hmm. that then can get reclaimed in the next temporal cycle as actually being kind of newly relevant or on time again. And the, the kind of mediation of those sorts of times. And so obsolescence, I think, you know, Issa Shrine and these, like the ways in which the metabolists claimed certain, or what was claimed as examples of metabolism, you know, certain ideas of flexibility, um, uh, sort of change, renewal, as opposed to certain ideas of obsolescence, I think is very, it's kind of attached to that sort of thing. So obsolescence is again, one of these, um, you know, things that, you know, Daniel Abramson and others have, have been looking at, but that I think is kind of floating in the orbit of, you know, the temporal sort of stuff that we've been looking at. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, Enrique, I think uh, I saw you wanted to jump in. Um, Matt, I saw you had another question as well, but I wanted to ask, uh, Francis, you've been very, very patient uh, over there. Um, perhaps um, we'll get Enrique's uh, input, and then uh, if you have anything you would like to ask, um, uh, we can go to you and then Matthew will come back to you. That's okay. All right. No sound, Enrique. I think. Uh, there we go. Maybe, there we go. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry I'm, I'm, I have really, really bad headphones. So um, thank you. Thank you for this talk. Uh, and thank you for this discussion. This is, of course, this is a, a topic that's uh, very interesting. And also, I feel like I know a lot of you from social media or something like that, even though I've only met a couple of, a handful of you face to face. But um, uh, on this topic of just like the issues, we, the issues, the attendant issues with the categorization, the categorization of something as late, post or whatnot. Uh, I wanted to go to uh, um, two things that are kind of like, let's call it part of the canon of lateness, which is like Edward Said's on late style and then Peter Eisenman's kind of like incorporation of it into his own writings. And I've always had a huge problem with those two essays and, the, and what it is, well, first of all, um, uh, Edward Said's uh, piece, it's like, it's, it's, it's almost in the form of an interview or the response to an interview. And all his case, all the examples he uses are real fuddy-duddy, kind of like super upper echelon, kind of, you know, dirty and like Henry James or whoever, you know, whatever. It's like super Western, right? Um, and then uh, it's and like he's, when he's trying to do Adorno onto Adorno. I mean, it's the way that right, Adorno right. is super rarefied. It's like Said is the only person actually who's capable of engaging with right. Adorno right. on that level because he is right. that, that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then Peter and Peter Eisenman, uh, he makes a, a huge deal of using Thomas Pynchon. Um, uh, and the things like what bothers me about their responses is that they treat the work of the artist as this, as inherently stable. Mm. Right. And that's a problem. And, and I think that's maybe one of the ways we can start addressing this issue of lateness, because it's a way to incorporate uh, instability, the instability of a canon or the instability of a body of work, you know, the way um, the way that it moves at different kinds of rates and stuff. And I and there's there and there's like a there's like a, his, a history to it. So, for example, like in you know, in Greek antiquity, comets were explained in terms of what's called an epicycle, like stars that moved backwards in the sky instead of forwards, for example. Or, um, and the thing is like, uh, and I love this idea of, and 
I love the idea, and I wonder, and I wonder, I wonder how appropriate this is too, though. You know, whether lateness is just something that's built into just the idea of modernity, first of all. So, you know, when I teach, when I teach the, you know, the canon, you know, when I teach like uh, Mies and Le Corbusier, the very first thing that I remind my students is like, these are people that are born in the 19th century, right? These are people, this is like, you know, like, like Le Corbusier's introduction to architecture was the Acropolis, you know, and then, you know, and Mises' neoclassicisms like extend all the way back when he to when he was working with Peter Behrens, right? And I just keep thinking of like all these other like metaphors that can kind of start being used, or these other case studies that can kind of be wrapped into the, this discussion of lateness. This is like everything from like uh, Ter Terry Eagleton's description of what he calls a Janus face temporality, mm -hmm. you know, the ability to look forwards and backwards at the same time, to uh, uh, Hegel's Alla Minerva, right? You only you only know about something only after it's arrived, and that's like the condition of modernity. You know? So I'll yeah, leave it as that. Yeah, I yeah. Go on. Alla Minerva. I mean, no, no, but I mean, I totally the the like the the, the Benjamin, you know, framing of the Paul Clay uh, Alla Minerva is absolutely one of these, I think, kind of emblems of right the way that you know. Yeah, as you say, lateness might be, you know, the condition of belatedness or lateness might just be sort of part and parcel of you know, woven into a certain ideas of modernity from the beginning. And it's, I think the problem, the problem you identified of the idea of a stable or linear um, uh, trajectory, either for an individual artist or for a group, for a kind of generational group is a huge problem. And that's, I mean, a lot of this, I think, if we all sat down and tried to figure out what some of the core kind of stakes or fights in the project are, I think, you know, on the one hand, there's, there's definitely a fight or sort of stakes around basically art historical periodization, namely the idea of the early, early avant-garde, the high or middle, or what for an individual artist, like in the Said is the mature period, and then the idea of the kind of late, right? And this kind of, this very nice, sort of arc and the, and all the stuff that is implied by it, right? High is, you know, early avant-garde is a thing that does, it lacks, you know, does not yet have, is kind of out of sync with its culture, does not have mainstream acceptance, you know, high or mature is this kind of narrow ledge where uh, things have achieved, you know, just for a brief moment, kind of the right, exactly the right balance of, let's say mainstream acceptance, but still criticality, still a kind of energy of the original project. And then very quickly you descend into the late, but it, it, it relies, as you're saying, on, on a no, the notion that you can package, you know, that you can sort of hang things on this very stable progression and that that fits kind of all, you know, all artists or all uh, time periods, right? It comes, I mean, the Renaissance, the Gothic, I mean, the ways in which it was applied. And, and so part of it is, is to try to expose the ways in which it doesn't fit a lot of the production of the period that uh, certainly that I talked about in the talk, you know, the last 50 years of stuff, the way that those labels just don't fit at all, right? And, and the corollary to that um, is also that uh, the, the malaise with identifying something within a certain period, it, all, it, it has to do with reception. You know, and the thing is like, and that becomes particularly troublesome for architects who arrive late on the historiographic scene. And I speak, I, I, I'm currently working on a, on a research project involving Eero Saarinen. Eero Saarinen is, is a person who kind of like is in the same boat as Birkert because he's a person who, who saw himself as modern, you know, and he was like assumed to be modern, you know, in the, you know, in historiographies, you know, and then but there was no way to process that because there wasn't really any kind of like serious archival work that was that was kind of like congealed into an exhibit until 2006. Yeah, well, he was right. He was both early. He exists in a very weird temporality. He was both early and late, right? He was early in the sense that he was precocious, right? D did a huge, you know, a ton of work, you know, very large projects at a very young age, you know, out of his pedigree, etc. You know, died at a very young age, but then, but then in I mean, historiographically, then goes through this long <clears throat> sort of period where, you know, he's dismissed partly on the Bannum style for the job kind of grounds and, the da -da -da, and then it has to get brought back later. But it's absolutely, you know, versus, yeah, people like, you know, Burkhardt's who gain recognition when they're, you know, 
quite old in a lot of, I mean, they, but they, so they sort of come back and come back and come back, right? Uh, Francis, do you have any uh, a question or anything to add? Um, uh, thank you, Michael, for the for the wonderful talk. Um, I'm I'm a little bit of an interloper because I'm coming from a, an art historical background, and in fact, the conversation has just kind of turned uh, into the the territory that that I've been thinking about, and I guess through through the talk and through the conversation. Um, I kept thinking of something like the Mannerist period mm -hmm. and how that relates to to the, the high Renaissance. And I've often wondered if the last however many decades has been a kind of a, another iteration of a form of Mannerism. Um, but um, you, you've kind of or, or already touched on that in just in, in uh, Enrique's question. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I think, well, this is what I mean about the the received art historical periodization that for mm. me comes from originally, I think, uh, I would guess is from uh, precisely the Renaissance, the idea of, you know, the Renaissance, the high Renaissance, and then, you know, mannerism sort of into Baroque, et cetera. <clears throat> and a lot of the messiness of, <clears throat> of the, you know, the category of, mannerism in that in that sort of periodization and then you know there's all sorts of work i think andrew leach and other people have been working on you know the relationship between those notions of mannerism in relation to basically postmodernism and ideas of kind of late you know late what now would what i would say would fall into the, the category of late modernism and I, and I think maybe there again the part of the i mean i'm not um let necessarily totally up to speed on the comparisons, but my sense is that some of the attempts to really compare, you know, the post sort of postmodernist, uh, postmodern movement to uh, what's described as mannerism tends to shake out again on the terrain of, you know, historic, witty historical references, yeah. you know, kind of playing, careful playing with elements in a very sort of cerebral, uh, non intuitive way, et cetera, et cetera. But that it may be that actually lateness is a more productive register on which to try to try to make the comparison, right? Precisely because I, you know, I think that th this is the thing of the kind of wormhole of some of the postmodernism discussions that tend to trade on all of that stuff very, very quickly, right? Hmm. Wasn't there um, just to just to jump in? Um, I can't remember his name. He was the director of the the, the Wexner Center. Uh, he's active at SciArc now. Um, didn't he, Kipnis. Kipnis, yes. Didn't he, I, I'm almost fairly certain it was him, but is, is he the one that, did, that said that all architecture can be classified as either modernist or mannerist? Yeah, they might have been Kipnis, yeah. Uh, yeah, it sounds like something he would, he would say, but I'm, I'm almost. Yeah, but Kipnis I'm, I'm, was, for example, obsessed for the longest time with uh, Regal with late Roman art industry, just to. Right, right, right. Um, I, I, something else to throw in might be subcultures, though, and actually subaltern studies as a, mm -hmm. um, y you know, it's, th this was also the period, right, um, when, when cultural studies and subcultural studies sort of took off, right, the, the, um, the 70s, I suppose, and, and when they're, you know, it's funny, it, it's kind of normally portrayed as the sort of breakdown or fragmentation of a hegemonic culture. But, but you know, it's also from another point of view, um, when that idea of culture per se really solidified, right? You, you know, the, the um, yeah, the, the idea that there would be a sort of classical hegemonic culture really only came about right as, um, it was sort of posited that it was sort of breaking down into a bunch of different pieces, right? Stylistic pieces, um, but y y you know, also, um, yeah, I, I, I wonder if, um, you know, I, I hesitate to go down this road because it, you know, there's there's really a danger here of, of just sort of making it a, discussion of style and, you know, sy symbolizing and, and uh, sort of identity politics or something playing out through ar architectural form. But, 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know. If the if a kind of discussion of um, what lo local cultural values or something like that maybe yeah. could yeah. Um, be uh, that that kind of a subaltern um, sort of framework could could be yeah. used maybe. Yeah. Well, and so at the same time, I mean, this reminds me of that at the same time in exactly that period, that's when the you know term the term modernism as a, this, the ism of it is getting codified also right it's a, exactly as a term that is not really used that much before it's not that I mean it's the sort of ism always comes after the codification comes you know absolutely basically at the moment of a set of claims of fracturing or breaking down the previous thing in a way you have to formulate and codify the previous thing right you have to kind of reify the you know the thing itself. And that's absolutely it happens both within architecture culture and then as you're as you're saying you know much more broadly um outside of it right but yeah yeah okay i think um we've gone on almost about an hour now um yeah. with this fascinating conversation ari had one more um follow-up uh question um i think it probably relates to uh, a question that I was going to try and end with, but I will let Ari take it. And I think um, for also those of you who are interested, it might impinge a little bit on the project that Michael and I were going to work on or are going to work on when he is here, which has to do with issues of representation uh, and temporality. Um, so uh, Ari, if you'd yeah, like so to wrap my, this up. I mean, my take out of this coming from current work I'm doing on photography, architectural photography and also in dialogue with uh, Sylvia Lavin's take on photography, which emerges out of her work on contemporaneity, which you're, I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, but this no, and and it, what sparked for me also was the the notion in your talk where you mentioned that Drexler thought of a particular kind of photography as capturing a particular kind of moment in a certain way, but also in relation to what Melanie was raising in the way that Issei Shrine was mobilized um, in in certain ways, both for modernism and for postmodernism, because its original photography by Watanabe was an ancient shrine taken through a modern photographer's lens, then used for these other purposes. Um, but the, the photographs themselves, the repre as a representational medium, are in this complex temporalities that you're talking about, where you're looking at past things being made present and being reactivated in some cases discursively for the future and what role the medium play in these complex temporalities because photography collapses several of those temporalities in the media itself. Yeah, or in the, or in the cases where you know, photography is being used to try to capture a certain kind of presentness that's you know highly ephemeral but that uh, you know somebody like Drexler is claiming that uh, really the ideal space for seeing the optical project of these mirror glass kind of glass skin buildings is in the space of the photograph because it's only in the photograph that you can capture the the clouds and the kind of fleeting reflections and the kind of you know effects of the sun and all of these things and that uh, I think he says in this, it's it from an interview on, on a response to criticism of transformations in modern architecture, where he says, these buildings only have a half-life as buildings, but their true existence is in the photograph in a lot of they ways. Live, right? They live eternally in the photograph. If you can capture, if it's a certain kind of photographer, like, and so Wayne Tom was, the, you know, one of the, uh, the photographers that was most able to do it, I think, for these, for Drexler and others, to capture, you know, the exact moment of the kind of, you know, pattern of the clouds or these sorts of things. And so there were a few slides, I think the intro slide, and then it kind of popped up later, there were a few images of, you know, photog contemporary photographers that I feel are channeling a lot of the aesthetic and the kind of stakes of some of the photographer photography that was going on at the time. So like Boz Prinson quite heavily and other sorts of people, but we're right, there's absolutely, so that's, you know, one register of representation that I think just has to be dealt with, at least to look at the particular historical period of those kinds of glass skin buildings is photography as a mode of representation. And then, you know, the project that Jordan and I were, were uh, you know, are sort of in the process of exploring has to do um, very heavily with drawings, with architectural drawings as kind of another 
regime or register of representation that seems like it's now, you know, you can put it into the same discussion. And so part of that is taking on things like, uh, you know, the idea of post-digital drawing. So Sam Jacobs and uh, the studios that he's been teaching at Yale, for example, on this idea of the post-digital as again, one of these very funny terms for, you know, the idea of drawings that are done digitally, so they're not actually post anything, but that, you know, they're digital drawings, but that are channeling and explicitly going back to techniques and sort of aesthetics of representation that came before and that are very often, you know, referentially precisely from the period that, you know, we've been looking at with all of this other stuff, so draw, which is to say drawings from the 70s, drawings from the 80s that were themselves starting to uh, deal in references, incorporating a lot of kind of, you know, historical references and in-jokes and all of these things and the way that it again becomes kind of layered and layered and layered so that something is, you know, a contemporary drawing that's trying to also look like an Ed Ruscha painting plus some Hockney plus some uh, OMA, you know, Zengalese and, you know, Alex Wall drawing, you know, these, the way that it sort of goes down the wormhole, but that it's described as post-digital. So it seemed like there, it was yet another way of kind of cracking the, the nut of these things in some sense. So that was, that was sort of what I alluded to and talk a little bit as some of the representational projects that we, that, you know, is kind of hanging there somewhere. So, yeah. Both, both photography and drawing, I would say, are part of that. Okay. Um, so, uh, as I said, um, we're bang on an hour now. Um, so, about twice as long as we were scheduled to go, but I think a very fascinating uh, discussion. Um, I'm actually quite glad that it was uh, such, a, such a small uh, group of people because I think we could have a really nice discussion all together. Um, and it was very great to see all of you. I haven't gotten the chance to see some of you for far too long. Um, uh, but... Uh, it's good to see all, all uh, so many familiar faces, and uh, thank you all for taking the time. And um, if there are any pressing questions that we weren't able to get to, Michael has uh, very generously um, said that he uh, that you can email him um, at his uh, University of Houston address, which is mkubo at uh.edu. Right? Yes. Um, and uh, so hopefully uh, this conversation um, uh, will continue. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, and uh, well, we hope to see you uh, at some of these events uh, again in the future.